Welcome to the panel on faith and the presidency. Perspectives from the evangelical community. A community that represents between 35 and 40 percent of Americans. I'm Charles Powell, affiliated faculty member at the Ansari Institute and adjunct professor of Muslim Christian Dialogue at Holy Cross College, Notre Dame. This discussion is presented by the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, part of the Keough School of Global Affairs here at Notre Dame. It is co-sponsored by the University of Notre Dame's Department of American Studies and the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. Today, we will explore the complexity and diversity of contemporary evangelical Christian movements in the United States in an atmosphere of civil and respectful dialogue. Please note that the views shared by the panelists do not necessarily reflect the views of the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. As the 2020 U.S. elections approach, the electorate is overwhelmingly polarized, even within members of the same faith communities. It has been said, our democracy is being tested, not by our disagreements, but by how we manage them. We are confronted by an important question. Can we listen to each other with empathy despite our disagreements? Today, I am joined in this discussion with three spiritual leaders from the born again evangelical Christian community. Each leader will speak on issues with political and moral implications, from inequality and climate change, to immigration, abortion, and racism. The hope is that this conversation will be conducted in an atmosphere of civil and respectful dialogue. On behalf of the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our three panelists. First, I introduce you to Becky Fisher. Becky is an apostolic minister writer, public speaker, graphic artist, and more. She is the founder and director of Kids in Ministry International, also known as Kimmy. Kimmy is a multifaceted ministry that trains children to walk in the supernatural power of God. She has written several books, including Redefining Children's Ministry in the 21st Century, Jesus Count, My Story, a biographical review of the Oscar-nominated movie Jesus Count, and The Adventures of Ivy and God, and her most recent book, The Holy Spirit and Me, just to name a few. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. Our next guest is Mike Kramer. Mike is the founder of the Power for Living Ministry and senior pastor of New Life Church in Osceola, Indiana. He, his emphasis on positive faith encourages believers and builds a bridge to those exploring the Christian faith. His Power for Living radio broadcast are on Sundays at 7.15 a.m. on WSBT 960 a.m. Pastor Mike is the teacher for the Power for Living Academy. He has authored two books, Power Moments, 52 short chapters filled with positive motivation and powerful inspiration, and the second book, Dynamics of Effective Leadership and Development, a 12-session Bible study on the foundational values for effective ministry. Pastor Mike, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Powell. And finally, please welcome John Owen Chiqua. Pastor John is pastoring Cornerstone Church in the historic West End of Atlanta. He and his pastoral team are eager to see the hope of the gospel restore a sense of family, dignity, and hope in their neighborhood through their local church of ordinary people. Pastor John is a council member of the Gospel Coalition and author of Prayer how praying together shapes the church. He also has several podcasts covering topics such as, do I have to tithe? But what about black on black crime? And when black and Christian collide. Thank you all for being here and agreeing to participate in this conversation. Our time is limited, so let's engage. The 2020 presidential election is in full swing. Democrats have nominated former Vice President Joe Biden to represent their party. 
and Republicans have nominated incumbent President Donald Trump to represent their party. Never Trumpers, independents, and the undecided will have significant influence in selecting the next president of the United States. White non-Hispanic evangelicals overwhelmingly support the Republican Party, while Black evangelicals overwhelmingly support the Democratic Party. Both groups of evangelicals are comfortable being defined as born-again evangelical Christians. Polls show that 61% of Blacks identify as born-again or evangelical. By contrast, 38% of non-Hispanic whites identify as born again or evangelical. In this conversation, I invite each of our panelists to help the audience understand how this can be by answering a few questions related to the 2020 presidential election. All panelists received the questions earlier and have had time to prepare their answers. I will ask the same questions to each of you. You will have three minutes to respond after each candidate has responded, you may then have one minute each to clarify any comment you made or offer constructive thoughts to what you heard the other panelists say. In the event there is a follow-up question, you will have three additional minutes to respond. At the end of the formal conversations, the panelists will take questions from you, the audience. Throughout this conversation, please type your questions into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We ask that the questions be respectful and relevant to the conversation. Also, the panelists have the right to decline answering a question in the event he or she may not be prepared to offer a comment at this time. Here is the first question. And the first question is going to go to Pastor Becky. To the best of your knowledge, what are the top three or five political concerns of you and your congregation and our audience during this presidential election? And can you offer some brief reasons as to why? Okay, first of all, I wanna say, I don't feel comfortable just giving my own opinion. So I took the time in each of these questions to actually reach out to my followers on Facebook because I wanted as much uh, of, uh, general uh, answers as possible. So in doing this for this question, they came back with three things that some of them actually surprised me. The number one issue of the evangelicals that responded to my questions are concerned that other Christians will not vote according to biblical values. The concern is that they're gonna be more influenced by the news media, culture, and personal opinion than the word of God. The second biggest issue is concerning the loss of constitutional rights that we see vanishing before our eyes, especially freedom of worship is a big one right now. And the third biggest issue is the desire to see abortion ended. Let me go to the first one again, this issue of other Christians not voting according to biblical values. I want to offer an explanation here because if your watchers, your viewers are going to completely understand the mindset of an evangelical Christian, they need to know how important the Bible and its principles are to us. It is everything. I don't care what denomination you speak of, evangelical Christians care desperately about the importance of referring to the Bible for their opinions and decisions. What we've learned in recent years is there's two different categories of Christians. When you talk about uh, Christians, there is a category of born again Christians. These are people who claim a salvation experience uh, 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 that they have asked Jesus to come into their heart. And then you have a second category, which we uh, belong to, which would be the evangelical Christians. They are also born again Christians, but between the two, the born again Christians have less of an affinity uh, to the word of God than the evangelical Christians do. They are much more influenced by the culture, by um, the news, uh, by the, their own opinions, everything around them. They are not that married to the Bible itself. Mm -hmm. Evangelical Christians, on the other hand, we are like, this is our, uh, we have no opinion, but the word of God. Now, interestingly, all three of us will have varying opinions on what we think certain things say, but the point is, we still all believe in the word of God 
as our, our, our grounding things. So when you understand that, you're going to understand why, in my uh, answers anyway, I refer so much to scripture, because this is the foundation of everything that we uh, believe on. Now, the number two, the loss of constitutional rights, especially the freedom of worship. This has been a shocking discovery for us in the last six months to a year for most conservatives, not just Christians. And especially in the last year, we're discovering the hatred for the United States as a country, for the constitution of the United States, and how desperately extreme leftists are trying to destroy our, our um, confidence on every level in our nation. We had no idea to the extreme of our, how our educational systems, including high schools, colleges, and universities, have been systematically breeding hatred for the United States and the Constitution in our students for the last number of years. We kind of sort of knew it, but we had no idea how close we were to losing so many of our rights. Once the riots started after the death of George Floyd, we started seeing some things that really kind of opened our eyes, but then it really crescendoed uh, this whole thing with the unconstitutional lockdowns taking place across America in liberal cities and states. The most, uh, the, the most obvious to Christians was the hypocritical attitude and demand that people of all faiths, but especially Christians, give up our worship, keep our mouths shut, don't pray, don't sing, don't chant while you're in your churches. Our pastors are being threatened with heavy fines if they dare exercise their constitutional liberties of holding church services, and they are facing extensive jail time. If they Pastor dare. Becky, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so that the audience knows we are doing our best to keep this to three minutes, and when you see my hand go up, that means uh, it's a one-minute warning, and if they see it go up again, that means I'm about to cut them off. Now we want to go to Pastor Mike. Would you please share with us your thoughts on this same question? Well, thank you so much, Charles, for the opportunity to be here. I have tremendous respect for the University of Notre Dame, and this is just such an honor to participate on this panel. I want to say that uh, New Life, the church where I co-pastor with uh, my oldest son, Dr. Michael L. Kramer, we are a politically diverse uh, congregation. We have both uh, conservatives and we have progressives on the political scale. And the reason I believe is because we're a great commission church. In other words, we believe that the greatest need of humanity is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as pastor, my greatest calling is to announce the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the sins of the entire human race, and then invite people to come to know him and walk with him and follow him. So that's our greatest calling based upon the greatest need. So as a result, we have a lot of first generation Christians, and so they bring with them their backgrounds. My responsibility is to teach the word of God as I understand scripture. I'm very comfortable thinking in terms of the political realm that of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I also believe that those three concepts are very compatible with the Christian faith as we follow Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, Jesus said, offers the gift of eternal life to all who believe. God loves the entire human race. John 8, 32 and 8, 36, Jesus said, we'll know the truth. The truth will set us free. He said, if the Son sets us free, we're free indeed. And then when, so that's the freedom, that's the liberty. And then in the pursuit of happiness, John 10, 10, Jesus said, you know, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Christ came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. That's a life of meaning, fulfillment, and satisfaction. Now, when I think in terms of the political realm, life, the issue of the right to life is very, very important uh, as my understanding. I'm going to primarily represent myself because we don't talk a lot of political issues at New Life because it's so diverse. But I am very committed to the right to life. That's important. Freedom, our religious liberty has been under attack and that is very, very concerning to me. And so I'm certainly hoping that we see some changes there. And then 
the pursuit of happiness, to live life as God sees fit under the following of Jesus Christ and to pursue him and then to fulfill your God-given destiny, which I believe as government sort of stays out of the road in that and allows us to function, we can see that happen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Pastor John. Yeah. Um, so I would just lead out, uh, much like Pastor Mike and say, uh, first of all, when I speak, I'm primarily going to speak on behalf of me and not necessarily my congregation, because um, I pastor a diverse congregation that isn't just racially diverse, but they're politically diverse. And so um, in the past year at our church, we've had folks leave because we talk too much about race and leave because we don't talk about race enough. So I've learned that there's certain things that are near and dear to my heart. There's the top three things that I'm gonna speak for me and not for my church. So I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, clear on the front end and um, there would be a large portion of my church, I think that would agree with these. So the top three, I think that I'm concerned about is um, racial and economic inequality. That's one, um, healthcare, for all, uh, that's two, and police reform, um, three. And I think all three of those are very near and dear to my heart because all three of those, uh, I live with those realities every day, right? And so while I put racial and economic inequality as one, it's because I don't feel those issues uh, can be bifurcated. They're interrelated. We have one largely because of the other. Uh, Mirsa Baradaran uh, has written a book uh, the color of money, black banks, and the racial wealth gap that really helps to tie those. So the community that I live in, the zip code that I live in, 30310, is one of the hardest hit communities by the mortgage fraud that took place uh, 10 years ago that was the beginning of the financial downturn. And so it, 10 years later, the community that I live in, that my house is in, is still very much uh, affected by that. And that stuff shapes you know, the solar system that we're in right now. So I'm very concerned about that. Um, two, uh, healthcare for all, right? That um, the current global pandemic is disproportionately affecting communities like ours because of the access to um, healthcare and things like that. So that's a big concern for me and for us as well. And the last is um, police re reform. I think the issue has become uh, a mainstream subject of conversation that people uh, want to talk and pontificate and philosophize uh, about recently. Uh, but what I've learned is that just because something is news, uh, it doesn't mean it's particularly new, right? So this is a reality growing up as an African-American man in the United States, in the South. Uh, it's been a reality that I've lived with, that I've seen, um, some of the negative effects take place firsthand. And once again, I live in a community that's um, over-policed amongst people that are disproportionately, um, not just jailed, but disproportionately sentenced. So those three are very big things because they hit very, very close to home and affect our ability to minister the gospel to the community that we're a part of. Thank you. As a follow-up to this question, and I'll give you each three minutes to respond, you may not need the f f uh, full three minutes, but based off what you've just shared with us, which political party do you think best represents you and your congregation as it relates to the top concerns that you just voiced? And for this answer, let's go back to uh, Becky. Well, uh, I, I personally believe that it's gonna be the Republican party under Donald J. Trump. Um, and that's because of what we have seen him do and what we have seen him accomplish. The three things that I mentioned, if you remember, one was the ending of abortion. And that has to do a lot with the, you know, he has promised at the very beginning that he would select judges that would help uh, uh, reverse Roe versus Wade. And so that's an issue. And then the other things that we talked about was the political uh, things, um, the constitutional rights. And he has very much been outspoken and and, and protecting that. And then the first issue was um, Christians not living according to political values. I don't think he has any effect on that at all. In fact, he could use a little more of that himself. So, um, <clears throat> so but uh, with the, in regards to the other two, I would say for me, the uh, Republican Party. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pastor Mike. 
Well, I really try to embrace the principle of look for the good and you will find it. That's based on Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, where the scripture tells us to meditate on things that are wholesome, pure. Uh, if there's anything praiseworthy, to focus on those things, anything of good report. And I call that being a balcony dweller as opposed to being a basement dweller. A balcony dweller lifts people up to a higher level of living where a basement dweller might pull people down. And I'd like to say the view from the balcony looks so much better. So I'm going to look at the strengths of both individuals that are running for president. The strength that I see in Vice President Biden, I can answer in one word, empathy. The man has experienced tremendous personal pain, lost his first wife and infant daughter in that tragic car accident, and then a few years ago lost his son. And so that's very, very painful. My wife and I understand the pain of losing a child. January 5th, 2012, we lost our 28-year-old son, Joseph. And so I see empathy in others that have experienced a common pain. When I think of President Trump, the key word for me in terms of his strength, I think of the word economy. I believe that he has done a tremendous job in boosting the economy. Jobs that were just considered gone from this country forever have come back in, in a very magnificent way, just in our own community. My wife and I have commented several times as we travel the community, we have seen during President Trump's presidency, uh, signs we hadn't seen around here for 25 years, hiring now, apply inside, jobs, it just became abundant. Now, the coronavirus hindered that. And the way I look at that is I do not believe he's responsible for it. And I think those that want to uh, place the blame, I look at that kind of like a Monday morning quarterback. Everybody's calls on Monday after the game is over and everybody is right. So I, I believe he's done a great job with the economy and continues to do so. And I think the economy will rebound. And so I see that as a strength. And then here at New Life, we try for bipartisan support. And that was played out on Easter Sunday when we had Democrat Ryan DeVore, Republican uh, Linda Rogers, two state rep a representative and a state senator, helped us take a bipartisan uh, approach to ask Governor Holcomb. We put together an outdoor service. It was approved, and it became the standard for the state of Indiana. And I believe what we did on a local level, if it happens on a national level, this country would be so much better off working together. Thank you, Pastor Mike. And Pastor John, do you have some comments? Yeah. Uh, the concerns that I shared, I mean, those were, those were my top concerns, but they weren't, uh, my only concerns, right? So, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, other concerns that I have in terms of, you know, religious freedom, uh, abortion, all of those things. And so all of that to say, uh, in terms of my top concerns are the ones that I feel like they're the most pertinent for our country to move forward. Um, I believe the democratic party champions those best however uh in terms of yeah just that my my top concerns not being my only concerns as a christian there's an aspect of where i feel like um i don't have a true political home because i have concerns on both sides of the fence so with any election cycle or movement it's a matter of all right where are our top concerns and which party is going to help us move things better in that way. And so based on the concerns that I've shared, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it's clear. I believe the Democratic Party uh, is best suited to move things in the right direction. Fantastic. Thank you all for sharing yeah. on this particular topic that is dear to your heart and the, uh, as well to your audience and congregation. Uh, we're going to move along now to the next question. And the next question has to do with civil rights. The Black Lives Matter movement, according to their webpage, fights for freedom, liberation, and justice. This comes through social, economic, and political power. What does your faith tradition say about race relations, and what are some concrete steps of action that you and your congregation or audience would like to see moving forward to address this concern that many Americans have? Furthermore, do you think that rioting is something necessary 
to be heard? Uh, why or why not? And for this question, I'd like to begin with Pastor Mike. All right. Thank you, Charles. Well, first of all, I do not think in terms of faith tradition. I think in terms of faith foundation. I grew up in a bricklayer's home, and I can tell you, I learned the bricks and mortar of life growing up in a bricklayer's home, and I learned the importance of a foundation. Jesus had a lot to say about building on the rock and having a rock-solid foundation. So when I look at life through that lens of the foundation of, of faith, it starts with the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That affirms who he is and what he set out to do. He is the God-man who died and rose again for the sins of the entire human race, the entire world, for God so loved the world. Then the foundation of following his teachings, Great Commission, announce the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection to all people. The Great Commandment, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourself. Vertical passion should be reflected in horizontal compassion for humanity. And then the golden rule is absolutely essential in following Jesus Christ. I like to say respect is like a boomerang. What we send out is what will be returned. And if we give respect, we'll gain respect. And I just believe that love and respect are like twin towers. They're foundational pillars of all human relationships. And along with that foundation, I think of the inspiration of Scripture. That my lens and my filter, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scriptures, God breathed, given by inspiration of God, my lens and my filter for looking at life is through the lens of Scripture and following Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And I believe that that comes down to the golden rule in terms of race relations, of respecting one another, listening to one another. When some of these things began to flare up, I, I invited in uh, a, an African-American member of our community, and I just said, talk to me, help me understand, share with me how this affects your life. And it was absolutely essential for me to listen to him. When it was all over, he said, thank you so much, Pastor, for listening. So I think that's an important part of respecting one another. I do not believe that violence should ever be a part of being heard. I don't believe we break one law to try to accomplish something else. Love has to be the highest motivation, and that's the greatest value, and I just don't see violence wrapped up in that. Thank you. Pastor John, uh, could you please speak to this important topic? How have yeah. you been addressing it within your congregation? Yeah. Um, just to kind of frame it at the front end, one of the things that I do want to say is that um, a lot of times when we talk about the movement striving towards um, justice and inequality, uh, Black Lives Matter, the movement is brought up as um, kind of a standard or a hallmark. And I think it's just important to know that you know, Black Lives Matter, the official movement, the website, it is a single take on what some people think are the best way to achieve that goal, right? They were merely the first to get a patent or a trademark and a domain name and build out a website. So I'm not trying to take away from any of their hard work, but I just want it to be clear that they are in no way an umbrella or a pope or a progenitor of an entire movement they are the first ones with a website and a trademark to talk about what they're trying to um, do. And so in some ways, I think it's unfair to them and to everybody else that works to lump in uh, them all into one group. Um, so I think what action steps can be taken, uh, I think that, uh, I think we need to move past conversations about unity to issues of injustice, right? Um, I think a lot of times we think that we'll achieve unity by talking about unity, but that's to confuse the end goal with the pathway, right? There's a reason why there isn't unity and reconciliation, and it's because there have been walls or years of these uh, bricks of injustice that have been laid down to form this big wall. And so instead of trying to talk about how we all need to hug, 
I think we need to practically do things um, to undo stuff that was done in the past that keep us at an arm's length, right? And so rioting, and we've talked about all that, like um, rioting is never, it's not inexcusable, but it is understandable, right? So from that standpoint, I don't want to equate something being inexcusable with it not being understandable. That so often we talk about the rioting without addressing the reasons why. And we have to remember, actions don't take place in a vacuum. The riots are a planet in a larger solar system that is creating an environment to take place um, there. So I don't want to believe that it's necessary. Uh, I, I believe it's inexcusable. However, I know that people have heard concerns differently after the riots have taken place. So it puts us in this tight spot where, of course, we never think violence is the answer unless it's the United States fighting against British for their political independence, right? Um, I think as we look through history, we would love for people to be sensible, but it took a war for slaves to be set free. Dr. King was preaching that we should be able to drink out of the same water fountains, and he was assassinated, right? So we talk about riots, 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 and we see that there has been violence directed largely at a group of people that are just trying to get basic um, uh, rights. And then when there is a violent outburst due to the solar system that they are a part of, everybody wants to focus on the action, the byproduct, and not the things that um, cause that. So yeah, Thank you, writing Pastor is John. inexcusable, but it's understandable. Thank you, Pastor John. One thing, uh, audience, that I hope you appreciate, I used to be a Baptist minister, and uh, we, uh, are, the three that you see on your screen are evangelical ministers as well, and we're used to going on for 45 minutes or more. <laughs> and so trying to keep it at three minutes is uh, somewhat <laughs> difficult and trying, but we're trying to do that. I thank you all already for your thoughts, your insight, uh, yeah. the various dynamics that impact uh, your thoughts your, and how you're going to vote in the upcoming election. Uh, now I'd like to throw the same question to Pastor Becky and ask that you give us your thoughts, uh, especially coming to us from North Dakota. That is the big issue right there. And without trying to make excuses, the fact of it is we are products of our environment. And I've lived up here in the North Country since I was 14 years old. I lived in a county where there was literally one black person in that county. The, where I live now in the state of North Dakota, there have been less than 10% people of color from uh, my entire life, and the majority of those were Native Americans. So I have a lot more, um, if you will, experience with um, racial issues in the church in regards to Natives than I do with Blacks. So when this whole thing came up with George Floyd, I have to tell you, I was knocked off my feet. I mean, I, I heard things, but I had never really seen it. And it sent me on a journey because we just don't have mixed congregations in North Dakota. We have been primarily Norwegians, Germans, Russians, Italians, you know, and, and we just haven't had that mix. In fact, you won't find a church in Bismarck. You will in Grand Forks and in Fargo because they're bigger cities and they've got Air Force and, and things like that. But in, in the central part of the United, uh, North Dakota, you just don't find a mixture of congregations. My interesting um, background, however, is because our ministry, I travel to so many nations in the world and we actually operate in nine African nations and as well as Pakistan and India and a lot of others. And so <clears throat> I see people of color all the time. It just never occurred to me there was a problem. Um, I used to honestly envy being able to go to a church. I'd come back to North Dakota. God is my witness. And I would look around and go, we are so white here. And so it's been one of those things that um, has been a problem. But when this thing unleashed, 
it really threw me for a loop. I think it shook the whole United States in a way that we've never been shaken on this, uh, probably since the, the, the murder of, of Martin Luther King. But I find an interesting scripture where it says in Matthew 24, 6 and 8, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it, you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. It, then it says, a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. We have always interpreted that as, um, so Germany's going to rise up against Italy and um, Russia's going to rise up against China. I mean, that's the mentality. When you look into the Greek, it actually says ethnos is going to rise up against ethnos. That is racial groups, racial people groups rising up against each other. So apparently this is really what we're experiencing is, is actually a, a symbol, if you will, a picture of end times. And apparently we're going to be dealing with this till Jesus comes. Now, um, watching this whole thing sent me on a journey where I needed to um, reach out to the people. I have a school of uh, supernatural children's ministry. I have uh, graduates all over the world, uh, quite a number of African-Americans in that. And I, I was so stunned. I didn't know what to do. I just started reaching out to those people who were a part of my organization and just saying, how are you doing? What, what can we, what, what can I do? What can I pray with you with? What, you know, and I would ask them questions and it was interesting. They actually really didn't want to say anything specific. And, and I think looking at it is that it's just such a complicated situation. They didn't even know where to begin with someone as ignorant as me, as far as race issues are concerned. But I personally reached out. Now, as far as what goes on in the church, I have been shocked because I started doing some research, folks. And I started listening to people like T.D. Jakes and Joseph Garland and King singer Kirk Cameron and, and many others. And I was shocked to find out the discrimination that has gone on in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's not just down in the South. And it has been a real, real issue. And so how we, how we deal with this, that's a very good question. All I can say is that I am more aware than ever and reaching out as to as many as I can to open a dialogue and at least try to understand what they're going through. So. Thank you, Becky. And you mentioned dialogue. You know, dialogue is very important to me in what I study and what I teach. And it's this idea that we're, that we're building bridges of uh, understanding, that we're building bridges of trust so that we can collaborate together and do something great for humanity. And I believe that religion itself plays a very important role in all of this. So thank you again for your perspectives. I do want to uh, have a follow-up question on this particular topic. Uh, which presidential candidate do you think has the demeanor and qualifications to, to hear to de-escalate and implement improvements within our judicial system and communities that will help close the divide between the racial disparities. Why or why not? And I know I've asked you to go, I've, I've given you uh, three minutes to go on this, but let's try to keep it to two minutes so that we can get to some more questions. And for this question, I'd like to throw it back to Pastor John. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I would start out and I would say, um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Pastor Mike's words about Joe Biden and empathy characterizing him Definitely, it feels like make him better suited to deal with this is I think of Donald Trump. I think of um, the reasons why people have supported him is because of things like the economy and things that he's uh, done. He seems more like a conqueror than a diplomat. Um, and so from that standpoint, yeah, I, I think de-escalation needs to take place and um, yeah, just seeing some of his uh, behavior in the presidency on social media with, you know, name calling and things like that. Those are things that escalate conflict or to deny the reality of certain things that are there. Those are things that escalate conflict. So personally, um, Biden feels like he uh, can deal with this better. And based on the past four years, Trump's just interactions from a basic sense. He feels uh, to me uh, disqualified, like the worst candidate to deal with problem solving of this 
nature. So, yeah. Thank you. And uh, Pastor Becky, would you mind commenting on this question as well? Right. Of course, John and I are going to have completely different viewpoints on this. And I have nothing but going to uh, the internet and researching what Trump has done. I don't think any of us are going to argue the fact that um, that uh, President Trump is the chaos candidate. He's like the bull in the China closet. We get that. Um, we understand that. And yet he has been a man of action. And with all of his imperfections, can we call that, as personality imperfections, I have been actually shocked when I went and really studied, well, what has he done for the black community and does it matter? So for instance, in his first four years, he's created over a million new jobs for the African-Americans under his economy. The national black employment rate was at an all time low of 5.5. The unemployment for black women was even lower at 4.4. The overall black and white employment gap was smaller than it had ever been. He's created the opportunity zones that, <clears throat> that has spurred more economic growth in underdeveloped communities. Um, and they, they've helped through tax incentives and they're, they're on target to create a 100 billion new private investments in communities that need it most. He did the First Step Act, which is historic reform in the criminal justice uh, system, which is uh, bringing, uh, helping those uh, blacks and other colors that have been unjustly um, incarcerated have a second chance. He did the First Step Act, um, which included reforms uh, to help people get out of prison, get reformed, and, and go on. And then he signed a $360 million grant to support historically black colleges and universities last year, which is by far the most that any president has ever appropriated for those colleges. And even Barack Obama never allocated that much money for the black community. So Mr. Orange Face, with all his um, imperfections and his uh, weird mannerisms, um, he has at least tried to do something for the black community. And I think he deserves credit for that. Thank you, Pastor Becky. Now, uh, Pastor Mike, uh, you're kind of, a, you get to sum all this up here. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can sum it all up. I will say there's three words as I listen that come to my mind. And that is we the people. You know, this country is built on the concept of we the people. And I don't know that either presidential candidate is going to solve years and years and years of racial tension, but I do believe we the people, each and every one of us, taking seriously our God-given responsibility. You know, Genesis 127 says that we're created in the image of God. That means we have a mind to think, emotions to feel, a will to choose, the capacity to have fellowship with God. And so I, I really believe that if we the people collectively, together, and individually in the privacy of our own life, seek the Lord, seek his will, and ask in a humble heart, how can I be more respectful? How can I be more kind? How can I be more loving? How can I follow the golden rule better? How can I, as an individual, make this culture a better place to be? I just think that the answer is in we the people. And I think if there's a grassroots movement, you know, I'm kind of a, a rookie on this Facebook uh, world. I've only entered it just in recent months and I don't make political comments or any of that nature. I do read some things that are quite troubling, but we've got to get beyond uh, thinking one group is uh, because they disagree, maybe they lack intelligence or if another group because they disagree, maybe they're evil at heart. I think we've got to get back to we are all created in the image of God. And if we will take that seriously, we, the people, can make a difference. Thank you. Pastor Mike, I'll press you just a little bit here. That's fine. Uh, and of course, you, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But is there a particular candidate regarding this particular issue that you feel like has the demeanor and qualifications to hear de-escalate and implement improvements? Not really. Okay, 
Let's uh, move to the next question. We're going to keep with civil rights. On June the 26th, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down all state bans on same-sex marriage and legalized it in all 50 states. The High Court's ruling was five to four. The court's four most conservative members dissented. According to a 2018 article in the New York Times, the Trump administration has taken steps that run counter to many of the LGBTQ goals. It has appointed lower court judges that advocacy groups say have poor LGBTQ rights records, issued sweeping religious liberty guidelines to federal agencies and contractors, and argued in a 2016 federal lawsuit that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 does not protect gay people. Ms. Long Simmons of the National LGBTQ Force Task Force said, I don't think it's too much of a leap to anticipate that a justice who is confirmed to the court to replace Justice Kennedy actually could result in a situation where we have a 5-4 decision on some very key issues, whether it's marriage protection or the tension between religious beliefs and LGBTQ non-discrimination protections or reproductive rights. Now, of course, Brett Kavanaugh replaced Justice Kennedy upon his retirement, and due to the recent passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, President Trump has nominated Amy Coney Barrett to serve on the Supreme Court. There are now more conservative justices on the court. According to a 2017 poll by the Pew Research, young evangelicals support same-sex marriage, 45% according to the poll. As an evangelical spiritual leader, how do you understand and address this topic within your congregation? As a whole, does your congregation support same-sex marriage or not? And uh, we'll leave it at that and present the question first to Pastor Becky. Right, and this is like one of those topics that I, I avoid like the plague because there are so many complications to it. I mean, I've, I've got a whole list of things written down here that as born again Christians, evangelical Christians, we can just go right down the scriptures and talk about why it's against our faith and why it's against biblical values and all the rest of it. But I think everybody knows those things already. And I don't know how much it actually helps us to just rehearse those things. I mean, we're not ignorant of the word of God, um, but, but it's, it's one of those things that there, the human element of it um, is, is such a huge thing. And I don't know anybody anymore that doesn't have, and I'm talking about born again Christians who doesn't have somebody that they love in their family or in their extended uh, uh, friendships or whatever that doesn't, it does, is not a part of this community. And so the question is, how do we handle this from a biblical standpoint and not, um, and not make these people feel like they're second class citizens or that, that you know, that they're just these out and out sinners because we're all sinners and every single one of us is needs the mercy and the grace of God. And so it's one of those things where I really don't even want to get into um, in, a, in a lot of ways. Uh, we know what the Bible says about this, and we as born-again Christians cannot deviate from the Word of God. So we need the wisdom of God. What we don't want to be is we don't want to be told that we have to make your wedding cake. You know, we want to, if we, if, if we are in, we, we are in acceptance of in, in a lot of times of what's going on. If you're a parent, you're in a very tight spot with things like this. But, but the point is acceptance does not mean agreement. And that I think is where we really struggle a lot in the uh, society at large that really brings friction between us. But we need, to, we need to figure out how to be reaching out to this because we, all are, we are all sinners. We all need to, a savior. We all need redemption. We all need to be set free from the bondages that hold us back and we all have them. And so, um, anyway, um, yeah, I, you want, do you want me to go on and respond to the thing about the Obergefell and Hodges? Uh, not at this time. Okay. Perhaps we'll have time a bit later in the okay. broadcast. I, I really don't have much else to say. I mean, like I said, I could just go down the list and read all of these different things scripturally. And, and I just don't think it's, we, that this is the forum for that. 
Well, and I thank you all for being very honest because what we want to do, we want to invite the audience into our living room. We want them to hear and see the differences that are within the evangelical community. And so, Pastor John, would you mind sharing now uh, your thoughts on the question just asked? Yeah, so I think um, I'd align a lot with what Pastor Becky said. I think the, one of the first things that the church needs to do is we, I think we do have the beliefs that we have, but I think the first thing we need to do is repent of the way we may have singled out this group as more deviant than any other, you know, divergence that we see from God's words. So as a church, I mean, I believe um, in a... I'm very conservative and historical in my sexual ethic, right? And, um, but I think for so long, the church and even the Christian community has treated this class of people like second class citizens. And I think um, it makes it, what makes it tough as well is that this issue is as polarized as our politics, that it's either you disagree and hate them or you love and affirm them instead of oh no, no no i love and disagree and but there's a lot of things i disagree right with like i'm so conservative that you know i don't think people should have sex with their girlfriends if they aren't married so from that standpoint it's a but there is an aspect of how people are treated in society and in the world and i think there's nothing in the bible that would um um, you, you know, you know, lead us as a society uh, to have people because of their different beliefs to be discriminated against and lose their jobs and discrimination in housing and being treated differently in banking. And so from that standpoint, where we see issue or people discriminated against in some of the basic uh, things of life and survival. I think what the Christian does with somebody that loves and sees and affirms the Imago um, Dei in all people, regardless of it, creed or be belief, is we want to step up and advocate in um, ways that we can to help out. So from that standpoint, it's, uh, um, yeah, I think historically maybe the church has done a bad job in showing affirmation and advocating for rights uh, in spite of any disagreements that Thank we have. Thank you, Pastor John. Yeah. I appreciate your thoughts. Pastor Mike, I've been to your church. I know that you have a lot of young people in your church, a lot of young families. What is uh, What are you experiencing within your congregation and the greater evangelical community that you're a part of? Well, I'll go back to <clears throat> Faith Foundation. We all have a lens in which we view life, a filter in which we interpret life. And as a Christian, <clears throat> my lens and filter is the word of God. And so I'll start with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe that God loves the entire human race. I believe that we're all created in the image of God. As I mentioned, Genesis 1, 27, he created the image of God, male and female, he created them. So you do see in God's creation of humanity, gender distinction. Now, it's interesting, <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God says it was not good that man was alone. The, in Genesis 1, 31, he says everything that he created was good. 218, the first thing God says was not good was the aloneness of man. And so God created Eve as a companion for Adam that the two of them might enjoy life together. Now, in the situation of marriage, Genesis 2, uh, 24, the scripture says a young man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Jesus echoes that in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. So in scripture, the example of marriage is between a man and a woman. Having said that, we do not live under a theocracy. We live under a democracy. And so I would say as an evangelical Christian, I would wanna make sure that our voice is heard at the table of democracy. And so while we might respect the decisions that have been made, 
the Supreme Court's made the decision in terms of uh, same-sex marriage and so forth. What we would ask is that the Supreme Court in this country respect the evangelical community that might not be comfortable performing those kinds of marriages. So there's plenty of churches who will, but those of us that might be hesitant to do so and, and would not, we would ask that respect be given back to us to follow our conscience based upon the word of God. But that doesn't mean that those relationships uh, in society should not have equal rights, as Pastor John mentioned. Thank you. Uh, by just way of a follow-up <clears throat> question here, and I'm going to ask if you can respond to this in just 30 seconds. It's a very quick one. To what extent do you think the office of the president has any influence over this topic of same-sex marriage? And Becky, if you could give a 30-second response to that. Um, I don't know. I've thought about this um, as far as I think anytime you've got a leader, uh, if they speak out uh, for something or against something, there's a certain amount of influence. But how much one person can do, I think on this topic, everybody already has their own opinion. Pastor Mike. I would probably echo that. I don't think the president at this stage of the game has a lot of influence uh, on, on those issues. I think as a society, it's pretty much been settled. But again, what I would ask is that churches be given the freedom not to have what society has determined for culture to not be imposed upon the church. Pastor John. <clears> Through your question, I think the role of the president is a big one in this. You know, you just look at the difference between 2008 and 2012. So in 2008, you had Blacks overwhelmingly voting for Obama and against gay marriage. And then in 2012, with his change, there's just something about being a person in a position of influence. What you speak about in moderation as a leader, people are going to do in excess. So I would say that the president, right, that there's something about that role and the position where their language is going to shape discourse. So words aren't everything, but they're not nothing. Um, yeah. Thank you. Before we go to the audience, there are two more questions that I want us to consider, and then we'll take questions uh, from the audience. Some have already come in, but I want to move to the topic of gun violence. Uh, the United States is peppered by gun violence every year. Uh, for as long as I can remember, lawmakers on Capitol Hill have contemplated policy responses to the violence seen throughout our country. Since the 1970s, we have seen gun violence in the form of murders go down. At the same time, however, mass shootings and suicides have steadily risen. The Second Amendment provides U.S. citizens the right to bear arms. Ratified in December of 1791, the amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Having just used guns and other arms to ward off the English, the amendment was originally created to give citizens the opportunity to fight back against a tyrannical federal government. According to Pew Research in 2017, 39,773 people died due to gun-related violence. 37% were murders, 60% suicides, and 3% others. As Christianity Today reported in 2017, 41% of white evangelicals own a gun, a number far higher than the average American, and one that has likely grown since then. Influential evangelical leaders have supported gun ownership and advocated for its growth among fellow believers. After a gunman murdered 26 worshipers at a rural Southern Baptist church in Texas in 2017, uh, Jeffries told Fox News he felt particularly safe preaching at First Baptist Dallas knowing that so many of his congregants, congregants brought guns with them to church. Most Democrats and some Republicans say that sensible gun control or gun reform is optimal, yet white evangelical Christians overwhelmingly support the idea of God, country, and guns. So, two questions. First, can you speak to gun ownership in our country and share with the audience why you are for, against, or indifferent to gun reform, especially as it relates to your ministerial 
demographics? And secondly, can you share your thoughts on why there is so much gun violence in the United States? And what steps do you think should be taken to lessen the violence? And for this question, we'll go uh, back to Pastor John. Yeah. Um, so in one sense, I think this is where uh, I feel like I have a backyard and the political landscape has kind of built this fence right in the middle of my backyard where it's like, I own property on both sides. So I believe in gun ownership as well as gun reform, right? Sensible restrictions that uh, to continue to refine and improve the process. I don't think that it's an all um, or none game. And I think this is uh, incredibly important for people that are in, you know, communities that I pastor or just communities that I've grown up in where um, I think they're closer to the founders of the nation than I think a lot of us realize in that they know, uh, yeah, when we talk about the capacity of a government to exploit and harm and not to protect, some people can't fathom, but there's a lot of folks here that, right, can. So if things go down where I live, 911 is not the first phone number that I think to call, like so many other folks here. And so from that standpoint, um, yeah, I'm for gun ownership as well as gun reform. In terms of the gun violence, um, uh, yeah, I, I think there are just so many other issues at play. Uh, again, it's a solar system, right? This is not arithmetic. It's not A plus B is C. So it's not less guns, less gun violence. Um, I think it's more like algebra. There's so many other factors that are in play. And this is something that, yeah, I'm not qualified to speak on what would make it go down. I'm here to say, I don't know. And I'm happy to hear from somebody else about how to. Um, so I do think regulation needs to take place, but I, I am all for gun ownership. Uh, Pastor Mike. Well, I certainly support the Second Amendment. I believe it's an important right, the right to bear arms. Having said that, I have seen gun violence up close and personal, as we probably all have. But mm -hmm. back in June of 2012, a highly publicized double homicide took place in our community, mm -hmm. Matthew and Lisa Clippinger. And I received a phone call to preach a double funeral, heartbreaking, families devastated, two caskets at the front of New Life, the very first time I'd ever preached a double funeral in such heartbreaking situation. The man that murdered them was Matthew's brother, who had been in prison 20 years for murder. He was released. And in a moment of anger, killed his brother and sister-in-law. I mean, this goes back to Cain and Abel. So there are questions involved in that as to the, the prison system. There's questions in terms of the judicial system. Why was that man free when he had already murdered? And so there's, there's trouble there. I don't think this is a, a single issue. About 18 months later, I preached a funeral for an elderly couple that fell into despair. It sort of made a pact and in the moment of despair, the husband killed his wife and then took his own life. It was left families devastated. They'd fallen in despair. And then two years ago, I preached a heartbreaking funeral, highly publicized in our community, a 17 year old precious gal that was murdered she was pregnant, her six, six month on board child died as well. That murder took place with a knife. So I've seen it with guns, I've seen it with knives. I think the issue at hand, we've got to get back to understand that the root problem is not what someone holds in their hand, the root problem it's what is going on in their heart. And I think when we see heart transformation, we will see these other problems 
diminish. Thank you, Pastor Becky. Right. Well, you you know you're you're talking to a young gal who has uh, lived up here in uh, cowboy country and uh, buffalo country and deer country. <laughs> Um, my entire life, I don't know a family that doesn't own a gun, except me. I don't own one, and I've gone back and forth on whether I should. It's just a way of life up here, and we've got fewer muter, uh, murders up here than, and I'm talking per capita. I mean, people just know how to handle guns. They're, I'll tell you what, we started having a few more murders when people started immigrating in from other parts of the United States to come into our oil industry. But it just here, it's just a way of life. You're not going to find anybody that is going to be against the, the Second Amendment. And it was interesting because I got on Facebook um, shortly before this because I had forgotten to ask everybody, what do you feel about gun violence and gun reform and all the rest of it? And I had a lot of people respond. And what was interesting is there was not one person that says, well, we can solve this just by having more laws. And, and, and it was all, all of them. It was a, a matter of the heart, just exactly what Pastor Mike was saying. It is, it's a condition of the heart. If you want to kill somebody, I remember being in Australia um, one year. Uh, I can't remember why I was there, but uh, the son of the person that I was uh, ministering for got on me for being American because we have so many guns over here. Well, they gave up their guns decades ago. Uh, they don't have any guns. There's a few hunters that will have them, but they gave them up. And he was telling me what a, you know, bad place we were because we had all these guns. And so we had all these murders. The funny thing of it was that very day, the headline news of their local newspaper was a bunch of college kids who went out to the beach and found an immigrant college boy and clubbed him to death with a two by four. If you want to kill somebody, you're going to find a way to do it. The majority of the people that responded as far as the guns is that is uh, they, they, uh, there was a lot of people that uh, commented that it's a, it's a matter of, you know, if the Jews would have had guns, they probably wouldn't have been taken off to the concentration camps. And when you're talking about uh, a lot of, of, of that kind of thing, the tyranny was, is still huge. I mean, how many years ago did we break off from Great Britain? But it's still huge in the mind of the American people uh, to be able to have guns to fight against the tyranny of government. And I think with a lot of the rioting and stuff that's going on recently, I think you can see why people are running out and there's more gun sales right now than there has been in the United States in decades. And so um, it's, it's a I agree with Pastor Mike, it's a matter of the heart and we can put it, most people will agree. You can put more laws on the country if you want to, but the criminals are always going to have guns. So as a very quick follow-up question to this, uh, Pastor Mike and Becky and John as well, just in about 15 seconds, do, would you support a president that wants to bring about gun reform? Define gun reform would like to see uh, assault weapons taken off the streets. No, I think that's a big conversation. This is just my opinion. That's a big conversation. When you listen to people who actually own guns and understand what these things are, that they, they will tell you a completely different story than the guy um, that's saying, oh, we're, we got to get these off the street because they're mowing everybody down like machine guns. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it, I'm not qualified to talk on assault weapons. Uh, it is a very specific thing. So, um, so Pastor John, are, would your congregation be concerned that should uh, Joe Biden become the president that he would try to implement gun reform? No. So like I said, we're for gun ownership and gun reform. So from that standpoint, it's a, uh, we don't think, um, we don't think that, the things we have in place are sufficient. We don't think removing all the guns is going to solve the problem, but we do think that we can progress in uh, what gun ownership looks like in the United States. Yeah, and Pastor Mike? Well, I believe that's a slippery slope, and people better be really careful going down that path. I understand the question. I understand the concern. I've dealt with it. Uh, and yet at the same time, 
we got to be very, very careful of opening up that can of worms. So I would say I would want to see what the gun reform bills look like. Okay. Let's uh, have one more question here. And then I've asked each of you to present a question and you'll have three minutes uh, to respond as you uh, deem necessary. Uh, the final question that I will ask you today has to do with health care. Of 17 high-income countries studied by the National Institutes of Health, the United States in 2013 had the highest or near highest prevalence of obesity, car accidents, infant mortality, heart and lung disease, sexually transmitted infections, adolescent pregnancies, injuries, and homicides. A 2000 and uh, 2017 survey of the healthcare systems of 11 developed countries found the US healthcare system to be the most expensive and worst performing in terms of health access, efficiency, and equity. In a 2018 study, the USA ranked 29th in healthcare access and quality. Under former President Barack Obama, the Affordable Care Act was passed covering around 17 million people. Both Democrats and Republicans seem to agree that the ACA is not perfect. However, Democrats want to improve and keep it. The 2016 Democratic Platform for Healthcare reads, we believe as Democrats that healthcare is a right, not a privilege, and our healthcare system should put people before profits. Many within the Republican Party would like to have ACA repealed and replaced, believing it is government overreach. Furthermore, they argue that socialized health care is suboptimal. In accordance to your faith tradition, or Pastor Mike, your faith foundation, how do you think the government should approach health care? Do you believe that the government is morally, uh, morally obligated to provide access to health care for all citizens? Why are, why not? And Pastor Mike, since I mentioned you, would you please take this one first? Three minutes. Well, I think in the subject of health care, the first important issue is compassion. I believe that, you know, love never fails, as the scripture says, now by his faith, hope, and love, these three, the greatest of these is love. So there's got to be compassion. Let me just say uh, my compliments to Dr. Ansari. Ten years ago, I uh, lost a brother to cancer. And his oncologist was Dr. Ansari. And one of the things my brother Dennis said over and over and over was how compassionate Dr. Ansari was in dealing uh, with my brother. So I just want to say uh, thank you on behalf of our family. I think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, Charles. You know, a guy says, you know, What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the guy looking for a loophole says, uh, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. And he describes a man that's, uh, you know, beaten and left for dead and everybody walks by. But one man stopped. The good Samaritan had compassion, bandaged him up, paid the bill, took care of him. And then Jesus says, who is the neighbor? And the guy says, well, obviously the one that bandaged him up, that's found in Luke chapter 10. But the point is this, love does not look for loopholes. So the government's already involved. There's Medicare for the seniors. There's Medicaid for those less fortunate. We have the Affordable Care Act. You know, everybody keeps talking about prices going down. I could just tell you from where I sit, I have seen nothing. Uh, I, it doesn't matter who's in office. I have seen nothing but health premiums continue to rise. So Something has to be done. I think we've got to come to the table and, and so forth. But everybody's got to stop looking for loopholes. And I would say that's the insurance companies. They need to pay and all of that. People should not look for loopholes. But then I think of one quick example. When my brother Steve was 15 years old, he dove into shallow water and broke his neck. By the grace of God, he was not paralyzed from the neck down. The delicate surgery took place right here at South Bend Memorial. Dr. Denham did that surgery. One wrong move, my brother would have been paralyzed. My dad was self-employed, had had health insurance, but a lot wasn't covered. My dad paid every bill that came his way, but there was one bill never turned in, and that was from Dr. Denham. And Dr. Denham chose to see a higher purpose in his profession and did not turn in a bill. So when love sits down at the table, I think it's everybody, government, insurance, free enterprise, 
everybody's got to stop looking for loopholes and meet this need with love. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Pastor Becky. Boy, I, I don't feel qualified to talk on this whatsoever. I'm on Medicare. Uh, I got Humana, you know, I feel like all of my needs have been covered, but I look at families that have kids, especially if there's some, uh, just some horrible medical situation. I mean, I, there, there are so many different angles to the whole thing and compassion has got to rule us. But at that, at the same time, does that mean we have to pay for everybody? Um, I think it's a, a complicated question. I don't think it's one that we can just Simply, I think anyone that has been around socialized medicine in other countries, Canada included, will tell you that it is not a perfect system. If it was, why were all these people coming to the United States for their medical systems? So th there has to be some answers. As far as the Affordable Care Act, I was never in favor of it ever at any point. I felt like it was shoved down our throat. We were lied to from the very beginning and it's been proven out. And so um, I don't know what Donald Trump can do. I, I've been waiting for him to come out. I do know he's trying to lower medicine, um, you know, and, and a few things like that. And now it's certainly help. Um, but it's, it's like, it, it's a many complicated thing. And I, I don't know that I feel comp, you know, I can give, just shoot off some answers off the top of my head. But I, I think the people who really, it's the ones who are falling through the cracks. Um, that um, really, they would have more to say on this. This is what we're experiencing. I've never experienced anything devastating like that. So I don't have a platform to speak from. I don't know what John's experience is in the, in the African-American community. You know, so I don't know what they're well, doing. Since time is of the essence, we'll go ahead and take it over to so, John. Yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> John, just, would you yeah. like to share some comments on this? Your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I think I agree, or I think everybody would agree that nobody wants families to, uh, yeah, uh, who pay for a complicated surgery to come home and not be financially able to care for their families after that took place. So um, I do think uh, in terms of, you know, what does my faith tradition have to say about how the government should take care? I don't know if there's any, um, principles here that would superimpose themselves on a government. However, personally, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head um, in the question where you talked about um, a government should prioritize the people over profits. And one of the things that you do find out is it yeah, healthcare, medicine, all that stuff, it's inconvenient, right? It's inconvenient to care for somebody that's sick. And I think that one of the problems that we've seen is that we live in a nation that from chattel slavery to the disenfranchised to housing discrimination to gentrification has always valued profit over certain categories of people. So I think it's only natural that it would spill over into healthcare. Um, so that was why, or that was why I was in favor of the Affordable Care Act not because it was perfect, but because it was a first step, right? First steps are rarely perfect. My daughter took her first steps and she didn't nail them, but the goal was, hey, let's keep on moving forward in that direction. And so that's what I'm for forward progress when it seems like repealing and replacing without building off of what has gone on seems more like a backward steps and starting over than a building off the first steps. Thank you. Now, I know earlier, we're going to have to pivot here just a moment. Earlier, I said that we have, that we want to provide you time to ask a question and then talk about it, but we have the audience with us, and there are some questions that they have submitted, and so I'd like for us, with your permission, to go to those uh, questions uh, for a few moments here. And the first question is for you, Becky. Uh, this uh, person, Ms. Smith, asks, what is the racial and economic makeup of your Facebook poll sample? That would be a very good question. I've got just, this is my personal page. This is not a public page. Um, but on my personal, I've got 5,000 followers and I've got like 39, almost 4,000, excuse me, 5,000 friends, 4,000 followers. So whatever that is, and you have to understand that 
I, I, I have people from all over the world. So there were people that was even answering my questions that aren't even from the United States. Um, because we're, our, our ministry, uh, we, have, we have reached out. We're, we have, I've preached personally in like almost 35 nations. And so wow. there's people that go to our school and we, we have leaders in 14 different nations right now. And so we have people, so it would be impossible. I would tend to say that that it would be a higher percentage of women and that they would probably be in the, I don't know, 35 to 65 age category. But as far as economics, I'm going to say just pretty middle class. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Well, we would have to hear back from Ms. Smith to know that, but uh, hopefully it does to some degree. Uh, the next question comes from Hope. Hope asks, when people bring up issues with President Trump's character, such as with Stormy Daniels, what is your response? Pastor Mike. That's a great question. <clears throat> First of all, I believe that every human being needs forgiveness. Sometimes it's more glaring Sometimes it's more subtle. Do I view President Trump as a perfect individual? Well, none of us are perfect. The only perfect person that ever lived is Jesus Christ, and they crucified him. So I would say this. I would hope and pray that whatever has taken place in all of our lives in the past we would seek God to forgive us. That includes myself. That would include the president. That would include everybody. That we would ask God's forgiveness, accept his forgiveness, and then move on to build a better future. Pastor Becky, I, I see you nodding your head. Uh, do you uh, have something to add? To well, that? you know, I got to tell you, I get pretty amused at people that like to point to President Trump's past and his escapades and whatever it is, and, and especially Christians, just to really point him out. Let us not forget that King David had an affair and which a baby died as a result, and he had a man killed uh, because of that. Let's not forget some of the uh, biblical examples of the people that were scoundrels in the Bible. Jacob was a scoundrel, and here he is, the father of the nation. You know, and so I, I just laugh. It's like, it's, it's like, are you kidding me? Why don't we ever talk about Joe Biden and how he sniffs women? Why is it always Trump? You know, I mean, he's got as many fallacies, but we pick him out. And frankly, it kind of ticks me off. Thank you for sharing your comment there. Uh, I want to now move to uh, Pastor John with a question. Uh, this question has been presented to us by Anne, and the question is, the evangelical church is asking society not to impose and oblige to cater to same-sex marriage. Why is it okay for the evangelical church to impose its views related to women health issues on society? Right. Well, I think that's where um, the evangelical church, I think by and large, has done a bad job of having nuanced conversations, right? So I think when it comes to the issue of uh, abortion, there is the issue of um, the actual uh, abortions that take place that with, yeah, our Christian ethic, you know, diverges from what we find God saying is best for human flourishing in scripture, but I think being pro-life is so much more than just being pro-birth. Being pro-life is saying that we believe that the unborn uh, should live, the lived should be cared for, and the oppressed should be defended. So I think uh, instead of the evangelical community coming down hard on abortion as if it is the only thing and if it's the sole cause and effect, I think that we do need to say there are issues as it relates to women's health and economic justice and all these other planets that exist in the solar system. And we need to have conversations about all of those and address all of the concerns, not just the one problem that we do see. Thank you. 
15 seconds from each of you on this next question. This comes from Kelly. She asks, should we vote on the presidency based on personality or policy? Pastor Mike. Well, I would think we would look at policies over personality. I don't know that you can separate an individual's personality from their policies, but Lord willing, you can. I think you've got to look at the policies and make your decisions there. Uh, Pastor Becky. Definitely policy over personality. Um, you're not going to find a perfect person. Um, you can look at either one of the candidates and go down the list, and there are are real issues on both sides of the aisle when it comes to personality. I don't think you can single out one party. And so as a born again Christian, if that's who I'm talking to, you've got to look at the values that the party and the person uh, represent as far as your biblical values. And so this is going to include everything from voting for life. Um, and, and just, I mean, we could just go down the list on this, but policy is going to make all the difference in the world. Uh, this is said all the time, I know, so it's redundant, but this is probably the most important election of our lifetime. And uh, it's going to literally determine which way the United States goes. Thank you. Pastor John. Yeah. Before Trump running for president, you never would have heard evangelicals uh, put so little emphasis on uh, the personality as well. So uh, I'm answering the question both. And I think it has been a deep inconsistency for evangelicals to reverse um, a lot of the values that they've said in light of Donald Trump. Nobody said this 20 years ago with um, uh, Bill Clinton. So I think both of them are very important and personality when it comes to the representative of the United States is important. And I think that we should just admit that, that if we don't want to if we don't want to hold somebody accountable on their personality, that's fine, but we can't act as if it's unimportant like evangelicals have in the past yeah, six years. Thank you all uh, for this conversation. Our time is coming to an end. I just want to remind the audience uh, that this has been a conversation on faith and the presidency, perspectives from the evangelical community. Again, th this discussion has been co-sponsored by the University of Notre Dame's Department of American Studies and Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. Special thanks to the staff at Ansari who helped make this possible, Director Mahan Mirza, Josh Stowe, Sheila Cristoforo, Alex Shu, and Notre Dame IT. And panelists, thank you. Uh, for yeah, a provocative and very meaningful conversation. Uh, I think of the saying, we report, you decide. We've done some reporting here. We've had some great conversations. Now the community that has listened in will have to think through all of this and uh, think about what you have said or not said in the moment. And who knows, maybe we can follow up on these conversations at a later time as well. We'll explore that. Well, your comments have enriched our understanding of the evangelical Christian community. And so hopefully together in dialogue, we can continue to foster understanding, trust, and collaboration. Before I go, and on behalf of the Ansari Institute, uh, you, the audience, are invited to participate in a free online class that is open to the public. It is titled Everyday Religion in a World of Many Faiths. We have several sessions left this semester and a very limited number of spaces. To register, just simply go to our homepage at ansari.nd.edu. I'm Charles Powell. Thank you for joining us. And remember, every vote counts. <laughs>